Israeli sniper um, on Nakba Day in 2014. And um, a beautiful group of people arranged for him to come to try to raise up uh, justice uh, for Nadine, for his son, and um, decided it, it would be you know, a good idea for him to connect with um, parents of um, victims of police violence in this country. So 
we arranged for them to come during um, August of this year during the commemoration events um, that were happening um, on the one year anniversary of Mike Brown's death. And um, it was a very powerful weekend and, and more than just showing up, you know, Nadia and Carlton were part of that delegation. Um, you know, the love that they, they brought to the, the time they were there. Um, and, and I think the love that they witnessed there were, um, had an impact on all, all of us. Um, what, how did we get to this point? I mean, the last year feels like a lifetime, I'll be quite honest. A lot of the members of the, of the Palestine Solidarity Committee in St. Louis are here. Um, we feel like we've been through um, a lifetime of, uh, of events in this past year, and um, none of us is ever going to be the same. And how did that happen? You know, our organizing um, really got started at the PSC in 2009 um, in the wake of the awful um, war on Gaza, the first of many. Um, I shouldn't say the first, one of many, but the first in a series that happened in the last uh, decade. And um, we've been organizing around BDS campaigns, but we've always had the idea that our our work is anti-Zionist, is anti-racism work and anti-Zionism work, but anti-racism work. And we're, we've been reaching out into the community and the relationships we've built steadily over the last you know, six years um, came to this moment. You know, it didn't just happen. You know, we, we showed up on August 9th or August 10th. You know, this, this was, happened over a long period of time. Um, so when Mike Brown died, and the images of his um, body on the streets of Ferguson for four and a half hours were being you know, broadcast all over Twitter. It was impossible as Palestinians and people looking at Palestine you know, just seeing another heinous war on Gaza to not make the connections when I mean, he was there. And the way that he was being you know, prosecuted um, in the media, as, as responsible for his own death was, was a stab in the heart. There is no, no other way to, to see it. You know, the, the dehumanization of this, of this boy um, was, it just came at that time when we had already had our hearts broken open by what we had witnessed that summer. So I was looking back at you know, sort of our email communications, like what happened? You know, what, did, what did the PSC, how did we get involved at that moment? So, you know, it was two days after um, Mike Brown's murder that the first communication came. And it was very simply a message from one of our Palestinian members. Should we send a letter to Mike Brown's parents? And that's, that sparked a whole conversation about what does solidarity mean? You know, a letter to Mike Brown's parents is a very nice thing, sure. We, and we wrote it and we sent it and it, you know. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't change things. That doesn't, that doesn't address the structural nature of this oppression. And so beginning to, to, to dig deeper into what does the solidarity look like? Um, and you know, it, it became very apparent that solidarity meant being in the streets and being at the actions and being part of the movement that was rising up. So we were, we were showing up at the police station in Ferguson. Um, many of our members were there. Um, many of our folks, including Colleen Kelly here were, were being tear gassed and immediately saying, this looks like Palestine, this is what's going on. Um, and we, and we, we were looking at the, the faces and they were um, black, brown and black revolutionaries that looked like our people, they looked like us. And it was, it went from there. Um, it was toward the end of August that we finally said, well, maybe we need to do something under the banner of Palestine. And it was at, a, at a, one of the mass marches that we went there with a homemade sign, it was made in my house, um, that said, Palestine stands with Ferguson. And, and a few of us were there, with standing with that sign and not really like expecting to get, you know, not expecting much, just being there, just that, that was the showing up part. And the love that we received on that day was so humbling. People were coming up to us and hugging us, and thank you for being here. Like, there was shock. There was shock that anyone was paying attention. Like, we can't believe that non-blacks care about us. 
and, and there we were. And that, that began a long year of, um, of continuing to develop these relationships. And, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't, it wasn't a hardship, you know. We were there because they were family. You know, they were up, they were part of us. So, um, it was at the U.S. Campaign Conference, a little bit before that last year in San Diego, that we had begun thinking about what does it look like to have a larger mobilization of support for Palestine. We had a very close relationship with the Organization for Black Struggle. Um, they had helped, they were instrumental in getting us our Veolia win in St. Louis. And um, we asked Jamala Rogers, who is um, an amazing organizer in St. Louis, has been doing the work for a long time, would you welcome this kind of work? Because there had been a lot of debate about is the, is the movement in St. Louis or is the movement where you are? And, and so the, we were getting mixed messages about whether um, having outside people come in was going to be a welcome thing. And Jamala said, yeah, we want people. We, need, we want Palestinians here. Um, bring them. And, and we began mobilizing for a contingent to come to the Ferguson October events in 2014. Um, Jamila was there. It's the first time. And I can't believe it's only been a year. <laughs> um, and um, we were, you know, even at the U.S. Campaign Conference last, last year in San Diego, we got together, I think, in Rama's room, and it was mostly students that showed up and said, yeah, we want to come. What, how do we get there? What do we do? Um, Christian Bailey Davis was there, and I said, we have to be there. And so, you know, that was the start of, you know, he had already been writing and editing. I don't want to say, like, we're responsible, but it was, like, the way that he was able to bring later the the right to education students to, to Ferguson because he knew the people there and he was able to organize their orientation to Ferguson and, um, and those very same students have gone back to Palestine now to educate their own communities about black liberation struggle. So, you know, it's, it's very, it's a web. You know, all of this happens because of the relationships that you have. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, you know, most recently we had CM and, and Nadia and Mej uh, Kayal, who you'll be hearing from later, um, who is with Adala, um, living in Haifa, um, come back to St. Louis and without much notice, we were able to organize a, a very lovely gathering of, um, you know, people of colors, uh, people of color communities in St. Louis to come and meet them and to hear from Mej and to talk about what does transnational uh, movement building look like? What does it mean? And um, as soon as we opened up the discussion after dinner, you know, uh, Damon Davis, who's an amazing um, artist, said, wait a second, yeah, we, we know our, our, our struggles are connected. Let's not have that conversation anymore. <laughs> We're in this room because we understand all of that. Um, his question was like, what does winning look like? You know. We're, we're at that point now. We, we don't know what the end game looks like. It was a very lively discussion, but like, I don't know what winning looks like. When they're looking to me and asking me questions about, well, how did, how did the boycott work? How did divestment work? I can tell them like the logistics of how those things work, and they want to like use those tactics, but I can't, I can't tell them like what, you know, their, what, what that looks like for their struggle, and what that looks like in joint struggle. I don't know how that is applied. It was, these are the big questions that we have now. Um, how do we continue the struggle in a meaningful way? What does winning look like? Because I, I truly believe we have to have an end game. You know? um, our oppressors have an end game. Yeah. We don't have one. Um, um, what, what we've learned on the streets of Ferguson is that none of this is new. We're dealing with. Um, with issues that are age old. It was, there was a spark that happened in Ferguson. There's a reason why Ferguson became a hot spot because that community um, is portrayed as a broken and violent community, but you go to that place and you will see um, nothing but the opposite. You will see family and you will receive love by being there. Um, I woke up with the with the street chant in my head, so I'm going to try to do it for you. If you know it, please join me. Um, it's our duty to fight for our freedom. It's our, it's our duty, duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We 
must love and support each other. We must love and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Thank you, sister. Um, I, I have to probably go back a little bit further in time. Uh, you know, I wasn't in Ferguson. Um, my work was with the Progressive Student Alliance at Georgia State University, and additionally uh, with the movement to end Israeli apartheid, Georgia, right here in Georgia. Um, thanks. Um, so here's the thing. Uh, when I was getting involved with Palestine Solidarity work, you know, I was very much a product of American indoctrination when it comes to Israel-Palestine. You know, I had been taught that Palestine did not exist. I had been taught that, um, you know, to support Israel would be to be pro-Jewish. Um, that was the extent of my education. Um, so I was invited, I had, you know, my political uh, awakening, whatever you want to call it, started uh, when I was in the Women's Studies uh, Institute at Georgia State University. Um, you know, I started to learn more about American imperialism. I started to learn more about capitalism in all of its forms. You know, you know, we can't talk about a lot of this stuff without talking about capitalism and imperialism. Um, and so, I, you know, I went to France, and around the time I was in France, that's when Operation Cast Lid happened. And uh, that was in 2008. And so when I came back and I started getting involved with a lot of the activists here in Atlanta, um, you know, there was a screening that the movement in Israeli apartheid in conjunction with the Progressive Student Alliance decided to host called Slingshot Hip Hop, which is, you know, the story of Dem and the other uh, Palestinian MCs, which is an amazing movie and it's still a movie that I do screen and I do recommend. But, you know, before I'm anything else, you know, I'm a black woman here in the United States. You know, that is, as who I am when I walk out, sometimes even when I don't walk out the door. Um, and so I responded to Slingshot Hip Hop as a black woman. And I said, oh my God, Palestinians are black people. And I said that because a lot of the same narratives that uh, you know, some of the brothers from them, some of their you know, comrades were saying, sounded a lot like what a lot of our uh, liber you know, black liberation folks said here, a lot of what we heard in hip hop, a lot of the stuff I heard in the 90s. So it was almost as if I was in familiar territory. They were just saying, hey, at least we know that the reason why we are experiencing, oh, there are people over here. The reason why we are experiencing what we're experiencing is because we are Palestinian and they are trying to take us out. And being a black woman here in the United States, I was like, oh, that sounds familiar. I was like, man, see, that's how I needed to be ride or die for the Palestinians. There's a t-shirt that I typically wear. It's a red t-shirt that says, we are all Palestinians. And I apologize to some of you who might have been betting that I would wear that t-shirt. You lost your bet. <laughs> but um, I take that very seriously. You know, especially considering the presence of Ethiopian Jews in Palestine. Also, uh, the Africans that are being held um, in a separate camp. You know, so, you know, the United States and Israel basically have a lot of the same plans. So I felt that it was my duty as a black person, as a black woman, you know, as someone who is passionately anti-capitalist, as someone who is passionately anti-imperialist, that I needed to work to take this out. And so last year, um, you know, I, I gotta be real, you know, it is not an uncommon story to hear someone murdered or detained by police. And to be perfectly honest, we have Michael Michelle Browns here. 
And uh, we have responded to that. You know, um, some of the things that sometimes I'm a little jack of all trades. I also occasionally do cop watch, which you know some people might know. That's where we nonviolently, you know, record the police. Um, and we also do know your rights trainings. So there have been many cases that happened, unfortunately many, before Mike Brown. But what was inspiring to me specifically um, was the fact that, and I'm going to be honest with you guys because it is Sunday and you guys are here, but when they set Ferguson on fire and then basically the state had to respond, I was like, hell yes. I was with that. I was with that. And the moment people started coming out and trying to, you know, trying to say they should have done that, whatever, whatever, I'm just like, they left a man in the street. He was supposed to go to college, you know. And in black communities, you know, when there's a brother trying to go to college, that's something important. That's not just important for their family. That's important for the community, for many communities. And so he was stolen, not just from Mike Brown's family, but from us as a community. So I, I, I was cheering for, I didn't come to Ferguson, but I was with y'all. But one thing I discovered as I was keeping up to date on some of the uh, news coverage was that it looked like Ferguson, Missouri has a police exchange program with Israel. And so for me, that was just like, oh, really? Because I know of the beast that, uh, you know, is in Ferguson, Missouri. You know, while we talk about making sure that we get into the training, I keep hearing, well, police need more diversity training. Well, cops get too much training as it is, you know, and they're getting a lot of counterterrorism training in Israel. And what, what we, really? And this is a bipartisan supported effort, by the way. So the Georgia International Law Enforcement Exchange. We are talking about an exchange where senior officers, and I'm, I can only speak with authority of right here in Georgia, because I participated in, in doing some of the research um, and meeting with the university president uh, to uh, you know, basically say, hey, shut this down. Uh, so I can only speak to that. We are talking about an exchange program where senior officers and police chiefs here in Georgia and some of the GBI go to Israel to learn counterterrorism tactics. And so then there are Israeli, now we do not know for sure if they are the Israeli Defense Forces or if they are plain police, they probably are both. But they come here to the United States to learn drug enforcement tactics. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with Atlanta, but here in Atlanta, you know, we, are, we were home of the Red Dog, you know, run every drug dealer out of Georgia. A very oppressive uh, police force. Several members who murdered, you know, uh, I think 95-year-old Katherine Johnston uh, in her own home and then lied and tried to say that she had drugs and tried to kill everybody. That's how they do to black people. They make us seem like we are deserving of death. Even if we are an older, an elder in the community. See, some of you probably don't know Katherine Johnston. I didn't know her, but I met someone on the bus who did and they killed a piece of the community, not just her family. She was like everybody's grandmother. And so this exchange program, which is hosted at Georgia State University, a public university, there are, there's information that we can access that you know, is it, you know, all over the internet. But as far as some of our serious questions, you know, how does Robert, you know, the, the uh, director, uh, Dr. Friedman, how does he uh, define, um, what is it, P uh, com community policing? You know, when do these exchanges happen, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, 
we were not allowed to have access to this information. This is something that is heavily funded by corporate money here in, here in, in Georgia, Cost Communications being one of the funders. And you also have a lot of state support. You know, uh, so here was the Gilly program. This is what, uh, it was a three-pronged strategy. Uh, the intention was to remove the uh, program from its funders, remove it from the university, and also importantly, to remove it from uh, its impact of the communities that are, that are vulnerable namely black and brown communities. And so for me, during this time, anytime I have an interaction with police here in Atlanta, I always keep in the back of my mind that this was either an officer that was trained in Israel or an officer following policies implemented by an officer who spent time in Israel. You know, they won't even let us know, you know, really what the programs are, you know, they won't, you know, be held accountable publicly. So then we go back to Ferguson. And, you know, since I connected so intimately with, you know, the Palestinian struggle through my experiences as a black woman, then, you know, when I heard that, you know, Palestinians started being ride or die for us, that was like, I'm gonna be a little dorky. Anybody who's a fan of Lord of the Rings, you remember that one scene when the elves, you know, showed up and started fighting with the men. And it was like this was an old, this was an old uh, coalition. And so that's how I see black and Palestinian coalition. You know, I have many black liberation idols who have been, you know, loud. Vocal, vocally loud for Palestine solidarity, not the least. You know, we've got Alice Walker, Stokely Mato, Kwame Ture. Um, every, you know, that's basically a large part of black liberation is Palestine solidarity. So also notice that the same tear gas cans used in Ferguson were also the same tear gas cans used in Gaza just a month before. And then I noticed that there were Palestinians who were tweeting to people in Ferguson how to make gas masks. We are in solidarity with you. And I have to say that after our Palestinian brothers and sisters experienced such extreme massacre, repression, water, and, and you know, utilities being out, and then to be like, hey, we're with you in Ferguson, made my heart pound. I was excited. I was really excited because I felt like, you know, an old coalition that had existed before was being refreshed again. And so I think that in this time, when we are addressing the police state, because that's what we're living in. If we have exchange programs with an apartheid regime, you know, exchanging repressive information, we are in a police state and a prison state. So, and, and we, <laughs> thank you. It, and it, this is not just something that, you know, is, is corporations, you know, responsibility. Our state representatives support this. Our federal representatives support this, regardless of party. So I would say that this should be, you know, police, if we're talking about the training that police officers receive, we should also question why they are receiving training from an apartheid regime. We should, you know, ask our elected and selected officials, why is it that this is not a transparent program anywhere? And we should also ask, you know, those who are aspiring to certain positions within the state, why is this being allowed to continue and will they continue it? Thank you.
And so I think the prompt was like discussing tips or strategies for like cross movement solidarity or solidarity between different communities. So I'll share one that my dear sister Nalini Stamp knows very well. Nalini Stamp from Rise of Georgia right there. Um, revolutionary sister helped the found Greek defenders. That wasn't enough. She had to go find Rise of Georgia and a bunch of other orgs so, uh, recognize the power in the room. But so we, we first came together to start this organization called the Dream Defenders after the murder of Trayvon Martin. And we say murder because that's what we want to call it. And whether the legal institution of America agrees or not, that's their issue. Um, but we made some mistakes along the way. So the first action we did as Dream Defenders was to lead a march and wanted to go from um, Daytona Beach at Bethune, Bethune Cookman uh, and, and historically Black College University to Sanford, Florida, where Trayvon was murdered. And we wanted to do this march, uh, maybe reminiscent of Selma to Montgomery, it was some, like 40 some odd miles. Um, and we thought we were going to um, take advantage of this momentum and really push this thing over the bridge and try to get some justice for Trayvon. So we led this 40 mile march, it was beautiful. Um, just had great experiences. I mean, we, we, we became brothers and sisters on that trip. But, but when we got to Sanford, um, we realized things were a lot more complex. So we got there and uh, after the three day march, we shut down the Sanford Police Department and uh, we forced them to meet with us. So they actually, rather than arrest us, because uh, we had blocked the doors, rather than arrest us, they shut down the police department for the day. Um, they weren't doing their jobs anyway, so what's the point of staying open? <laughs> um, and so they invited us to a meeting in the back room so that we can negotiate. So that was mistake number one. Um, we were outsiders coming into this community. Um, you know, we had our chests pumped up. We were young radicals or whatever we want to call ourselves. And we got a meeting with the chief of police and the city controller, the city manager of these folks. And the locals who were organizing in Sanford had been trying to get those meetings for years. Like literally had been trying to get these people to acknowledge that something was wrong for years to get these people to be held accountable for their mistakes, for their injustices, for their crimes for years, and they couldn't do it. So here come these, you know, loud and rambunctious 40 some odd college students and organizers from across the state of Florida. And we got into this back room, and uh, Angela Corey, who's a um, terrible, terrible uh, person, uh, state attorney in Florida. Um, so, you know, got to acknowledge again our people. She's, I believe, third generation Lebanese or something like that. She direct files more young kids to the adult system than any prosecutor in the whole country. So that shows what she thinks about our kids. Anyway, so she calls us in the back room. She says, George Zimmerman's going to be arrested. You all should be very excited. We were like, awesome, sweet. We know Zimmerman's going to get arrested. Um, the city uh, manager told us that they were looking at getting the police chief to resign. Great, wonderful. Um, they were going to found a blue ribbon commission to evaluate standing ground laws and, and things like that. Um, and so we thought, you know, that we had achieved some, I guess, modicum of victory or justice. But the reality is, like I said, it wasn't our job to do it. So, so I'll summarize the learning lesson in a couple key points. Your first job in showing solidarity is to listen. Listen to the people most affected, listen to the people most marginalized, the, the people on the ground. We should have took our orders from the people of Sanford as opposed to coming in with our own orders. Um, the second, I think the thing that's really important for many of us is acknowledging that we don't know everything and acknowledging that sometimes we've been fed some bullshit, so we may have some biased thoughts or stereotypes, or we may just be wrong about things. Um, yeah, and the lady stamp is like nodding because she's had to check me on multiple things for our, our friendship. But, but seriously, you have to have the relationship where you're open and honest with folks about where you are so they can do the same with you. And if you're not right on something, they'll check you from a place of love. So um, be open and honest. And then the third thing is to simply ask them what they want from you or what they need from you. So the Palestinian community put out a call for BDS. So they answer that question how to clear, right? So when you go to these communities, listen, be honest and open, and just ask them what they need from you. And you know that way you'll save yourself some um, 
some heartache and, and save yourself from making some of the same mistakes we've made. So that's all I got. So the tool or the, the resource that I use um, in the work that I do is, is art. I'm an artist, I create art, and I believe in the power of art to change the world. Um, I think that it's a form of communication and it allows me to be able to share my stories and share my ideas while being able to collect and to project and to share the stories of other people. And I think that it's in the process of storytelling and story sharing that we can bring ourselves and we can be invited into unique moments of transformation. And I think that that's ultimately what the work that um, Solidarity is about. So I'll tell a story about an aspect of the work that I do and give two points that I think changed the work that I do from what it was to a trajectory that I think is a much more authentic expression of solidarity and black Palestinian solidarity. So I created a platform called Fifty Shades of Black and it seeks to affirm black identity while exploring the spectrum and the scope of ways in which blackness exists and manifests in the world. It seeks to affirm and celebrate the beauty of black identity um, and to offer non-normative counter-narratives that um, in a system that narrowly defines identity writ large, it seeks to break those open and say that black is beautiful and that blackness has value. And that the act of accepting and believing and sharing and looking at someone else and seeing their beauty is a courageous act. But in doing that work, I focus it exclusively, um, or at least a component of the work, on the black community. And we use art, we use storytelling, we use the power of being able to hear people who look like me and people who look like the sister right here, all who are, you know, we're on different ends of, of, of the phenotype spectrum, but we have shared narratives and we have a story that connects us, right? We use that as a way of sharing stories. But what happens whenever we share our stories is that people are able to come close enough to us to where those things that separate us, those boundaries, those things that are that the world has put between us, we're able to narrow the distance and be closer to each other. Howard Thorman says that we should get close enough to each other to where we can look into the other person and see ourselves. We should see them for who they are, we should see them for who their authentic self is, but we should get close enough to them to where if we go deep down enough into them, we'll be able to find ourselves, them, and every other human being. So what I found in the work that I've been doing with Fifty Shades of Black, and with all of these other art projects, and all of the other things that I've been doing, um, is that on some level, the concept of Black Palestinian solidarity was there. The concept of understanding that the black struggle was connected to the Palestinian struggle was there. The concept of understanding about the canisters, the concept of understanding, all of these things was there. But it was relationships that transformed the way that I went about doing that work to really be about authentic expressions of black Palestinian solidarity. And one of the challenges that I have for you all is that to really do the work of solidarity across the board, period, is to get close enough to someone else to where your heart can be broken by the things that bring them pain. What I was missing in my entire body of work with Fifty Shades of Black, though I had been talking about Black Palestinian Solidarity, though all of these things were great concepts, what I had missed was the opportunity to get close enough to someone named Sandra to where my heart could be broken by the stories of her loss. These were no longer concepts after I left Ferguson. I was able to get close enough because I was invited into the narrative, the personal story, the primary source that is our story. I was able to get close enough to that and see on to where my heart was literally broken. So these things were no longer concepts. The story that I'm talking about, about my black identity, 
Um, and, and, and the story that he was talking about, like, about his identity were no longer concepts. We were interconnected because we formed a relationship. We were close enough to be broken. My heart, our hearts together, were close, were, were we got close enough for our hearts to be broken by each other's pain. And that takes you being open to the possibility of making mistakes, um, um, and being close enough to where you can be uncomfortable enough around someone to get past the discomfort to actually find a place of comfort. And that is what the people in Ferguson did for me. That is what the, um, all of the, the, the love that I encountered that blew my mind about what I encountered with the, um, the St. Louis Palestinian Solidarity Committee and the, the, the hospitality that I was shown, that it has now moved me from thinking conceptually about the work that I do Shades of Black and these other platforms to really living out and incorporating into them authentic extensions of relationships that I have with real life people. And it is love that I now share with these people. And it is an extension of the love that I have for them that allows me to do not only for my heart to be broken by the things that break their heart, but for me to celebrate in real ways the things that bring them unspeakable joy. Now I met your kids. I had dinner at your table. I slept in your kid's bed. <laughs> See, those aren't things that you get on paper. If you as well-meaning white folk in the room, if me as well-meaning black people in the room, don't get close enough to where I can actually get close enough to, to where I can authentically understand your narrative to the point to where I can be broken by the things. To get to know the things that can break your heart to the point to where mine can be. And if you don't allow yourself beyond the fear, beyond all the things that stop us from getting to that level of proximity, if you don't break those things down and allow us to do that, we will never genuinely have solidarity. So it's genuinely and truly about relationships, it's not about talk. Who do you worship with? Who was in your wedding? Whose kids' birthdays do you celebrate? do summer parties at your house? Do they look like your kid exclusively? It's about a relationship. And if what you're doing is nothing other than talking and reinforcing a normative understanding in your personal, intimate lives where someone can authentically have their heart broken or celebrate your joy in the intimate moments of your life. If that is not as diverse as the work you're talking about, you're not doing the work with Black Palestinian solidarity or any form of solidarity. And up until very recently, I was not doing the work with Black Palestinian solidarity. But there are people on this stage right now that I love, genuinely. And then I put it all on the line for
this of humanitarian law, and all I can talk about is love. I had a business, I was just telling you then, I had a business meeting, my first lunch in Haifa with a colleague. We were talking about our strategic plan, and I said, the underlying current is love. Like, what? But yes, I mean, I think, so, I don't know, I don't know what I was, what's the question? What? <laughs> um, <laughs> tactics and tools to express, in fact, that love. How do we do that effectively? How do we start from love and from relationships um, and make transformative social and political change? I, I think that because we haven't really grounded our work in liberatory love, we've been missing something pretty important. And part of that is the, is the solidarity piece, which I think is what's going to change our realities. Um, in a way, and in a, in a way that I, I, I feel hope, in a way that I had not felt. I've been working um, with Ada for five years, primarily at the UN and at the EU, um, using, again, the mechanisms of, of human rights, of, of law, um, and have felt so tired. I have felt so tired. One, if anyone was in the workshop yesterday, you know that we lose all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember a case, even in the last five years, really, that we've won. Because the law is not the answer. And the law was never designed to be the answer. So what other tools do we have? And we've used international advocacy, and we go to the UN, and we ask for crumbs. We ask for crumbs. Last summer, um, a horrific massacre on Gaza. And I went to the UN crying, not crying, I cry now, but pleading for somebody in the international community to let two international experts into Gaza to, to conduct a fact-finding mission, which was a mandate of the Human Rights Council. So we're going and we're pleading with every European member state, with the US if they would meet with us, saying, please let these two experts in to see what happened. That was our, that was our ask. Our ask was not lift the siege. Our ask was not end the occupation. Our ask was not challenge the supremacy of the state of Israel, that wasn't our ask. Our ask was let these two experts into Gaza. And tons of resources were thrown at that ask, and I fled. I fled in March after that, after that experience back to the United States, which is crazy to think about. I was like, the hope is here. The hope is here, the hope is on the street, the hope is in community. Um, and it's changed, really, our, the way that we conduct advocacy. Um, our advocacy is not a, at a decision-making level in the United States. It's not targeting. Um, it's not targeting the traditional holders of the keys of power. We're not doing that. We're going to where the power actually is, where the change is actually taking shape, and the change is taking shape on the streets of St. Louis. Of Ferguson, the change is happening in Baltimore, the change is happening in these spaces where people sit around the table and ground their work in love. So, over the course of the last 
few months um, starting, I mean, it's the same starting point where you had um, just that perfect storm um, of atrocity of last summer uh, that sparked national consciousness here that um, horrified people around the world. And, and that was, of course, like where some of this work started. But basically, over the next few months, we just gathered around the table. We had friends from um, the Court Initiative who were here who saw that as really a key component, just getting people around the table to talk and see if we can ground and love, if we can express our values, if we can come up with something new, something imaginative, something that will actually change our society. And I think that was, uh, Shadiq was also there at round table in, in Chicago, Ahmed was there as well, and we had round tables here in Atlanta, uh, under the theme of ending occupations in Black America and Palestine. And talking about uh, our key concerns as communities and seeing where those intersections happen. And, and the conversation was really organic, in much in the same way that it was, I think, in the way we organized uh, San Diego work in, in, in St. Louis. So much of that was an organic process just because you were there together. Because you were there together and suffering together and feeling each other's pain and um, having your hearts broken. Uh, and from there, there's, there's real power for, for transformation. So emerging from these conversations, emerging from the relationships that we found, that we, um, that we built, we tried, and I think we should still consider trying, maybe as a, as a thought, just as a way to, to move forward and to also challenge the way in which our decisions um, and decision-making spaces in the international community are ordered. We had a wrap, we had a side event at the UN Human Rights Council called the Megali Ferguson, where we brought a father um, of Khair um, al-Din Hamdan, a young Palestinian citizen of Israel who was killed in November. We brought his father and we brought uh, organizers from Ferguson and Ashley Yates was there. Um, from the US Human Rights Network, Tenji and Harris was there from the ACLU. And, and we had a kind of a discussion at the UN on, on this emerging movement for, for global justice. And, and it was a powerful event, but the diplomats were freaked out. They're like, ah, what are you trying to say? Are you trying to say there's a connection? <laughs> that this is part of a system, like we are, we can talk to Israel, if you want us to talk to Israel, say that there were some things that were happening. We can talk to the United States bilaterally, but we're not going to start saying that this is a system of supremacy, and that's where this violence is rooted, and we're not going to maybe say something about that. And I would challenge us to continue trying, to, to step out of our silos, of our issues, of our regions, and, and the international community to do that. So we're planning, and if those of you who are interested, if anyone's in New York, um, to do something similar to the UN General Assembly in November on the issue of state sanctioned violence and, um, and supremacy with some of our partners here. And we'll keep you updated, but I would just urge us to, to as we look forward, um, to find those opportunities. And when you are lifting your own voice, and you're lifting your own struggle, that you're lifting it in the context of a larger human struggle. And when you're talking about your own suffering, you're grounding it in values, universal values, that affect and impact all of our lives so that when you achieve anything, and we might not achieve anything, if we do, we achieve it for each other, we achieve it together, and I think um, that's my key takeaway from this, from this space and, and, and from these, the last you know, year or so. Um, and one more thing I would just flag for you all as, as you're organizing in your own communities is that the working group on the, for the people of African descent, um, it's a UN working group chaired by Nene Fanon, the daughter of France Fanon, um, will be doing two delegations, one to the US in the fall and one to Israel in January 2016. And her plan, the nice plan very much, is to try to frame this as, a, as an issue of global, uh, issue of white supremacy certainly, and how do we challenge that, and what are the recommendations of the international community. So I would just follow that, because maybe you could invite her into your own communities, 
or you could meet her where she is, whether she's in New York or otherwise. So just to keep your eyes peeled and then find a way that we can lift these, these struggles together. And thank you so, so much, Drew. Thank you for reminding us of uh, Mexico. Um, yesterday was the one year anniversary of the disappearance of the students right. from Ayas and Napa. And, um, you know, I, I learned about that struggle through the work we're doing on um, black liberation and Palestinian liberation. Um, it was young students at, the, um, at Washington University, um, all Latino, some Mexican, who approached us. They, um, they came. They were looking to organize a discussion on exactly those issues. I mean, we, we have to understand that these um, these systems are not limited to our context that we're talking about right now. Um, they're much broader. And um, these Latino students wanted to raise up the issue of Ayotzinapa and um, try to find a way to um, promote the caravana that was coming through the US. Um, with the parents of some of these students. So these students disappeared. They were on their way to go protest, um, if you're not familiar, go protest um, government decisions that were um, going to strip state funding from their, their college. Um, this is a poor community. Um, the teacher's college there is um, you know, the only source of education that they have, they have access to. Um, on their way to um, see the governor, um, their bus was um, was forced off the road, and um, these, many of these students disappeared. They were they were kidnapped by um, by gangs, are you know charged with the government, um, and it's unclear what's become of them. So, um, and and the, and the killings continue. This is you know just one story about what's going on in Mexico. So the students approached us. They wanted to do an event at a very large um, public venue, the Missouri History Museum, that was going to be ta making ties between Palestine, um, Ayotzinapa, and Ferguson. And um, the Palestine Solidarity Committee was um, scheduled to be on it. It was something that we were promoting um, for about two months prior to the date. Um, with 24 hours before the, the event was supposed to happen, um, the, the organizers heard from the director of the museum or from the staff of the museum that the event was fine, except Palestine couldn't be on the panel. As long as you, you know, disinvite, you know, Palestine, the Palestinian speaker, great, no problem, go forward. And what happened 
there then was just truly extraordinary because our partners, you know, I, you know, the caravan was coming to St. Louis. It was like three days out. And, and I said to these students, I said, you have to get the word out about the caravan. I want these parents to have a platform. You know, we understand this is an injustice. This is, this is part of the price we pay for, for dealing with Palestine. Go forward. It's fine. We want you to have your platform. This is a huge venue. We had huge like, RSVPs for it. And the black organizers and the Latino students said, you're crazy. Of course we're not going forward. And we did an alternative event on the steps of the museum. Um, <laughs> that <laughs> we had a huge crowd. And we had, I mean, this is how you push, right? This is, so we're organizing way over here on the left, right? Um, but the censorship brought the issue to everybody, you know? It was like people that didn't know the first thing about Palestine or Ayat Sanapa and had said awful things about Mike Brown were all of a sudden saying, censorship, wait, wait a second, we can't tolerate this. And so they were paying attention to us. So it was you know, a way to amplify our voices. So of course our opposition you know, shot themselves in the foot. Um, when we act, when, so we, we also put Sunshine Request out um, and found out that it was you know, the pro-Israel organizations in St. Louis who put pressure on the museum to do the censorship. So we were able to raise up all kinds of questions with our partners too about what is the role of the ADL? Why in the hell is the ADL sitting at the table when you're talking about police training? Why? The ADL is telling the museum director, call the St. Louis Police Department and make sure you have enough people there for when the protests happen. This is the ADL. So it was an opportunity, it was a, it was a lesson. Um, and, and in my naive way, I was apologizing to my black partners, saying I'm really sorry that we are taking time away from your liberation to deal with this chaos, with this censorship, with this you know, anti-Arab, anti-Palestinian sentiment. And they, one of them, a young organizer, just looked at me and said, we need you. Don't, never apologize, we need you. And it was like, that was a moment that the light bulb went off over my head. I'm not apologizing, we're in this together. When their heart breaks, my heart breaks. Um, I think the, your question was, how do we address you know, these issues of imperialism? Um, and thank you so much for just taking a moment to remember, you know, it's not just Palestine, but I would also say additionally the Congo. You know, the U.S. has a lot of proxy wars in the Congo, sets up a lot of chaos, et cetera, et cetera. Um, while we have the hashtag, say her name, say his name, you know, however, we should say some other names too while we're addressing these issues. As I said, you know, we, you know, those of us who reside here in the United States, we are in the country of empire. You know, we have, you know, a country that you know launched drone strikes in Somalia, Yemen, and Pakistan this month. You know, they're like every two weeks since 2015. You know, that's not something that you see in the mainstream media. And it's not, it's definitely not something that the president alluded to while he and his lovely wife were wearing their wang. Um, so we need to be vocal about, you know, our elected and selected officials who make these decisions. We can say that it's a system of white supremacy, that is true. We can say it is a capitalist system, this is, you know, the president is the imperialist in chief. But if we're not directly confronting the state, you know, and, and we definitely have, you know, elders, you know, revolutionaries and radicals who can advise us on how to do that. You know, Malcolm X was, you know, one of those elders. You know, what are we, what are we necessarily doing? I, now, I'm an, I used to be an educator. Um, I used to teach uh, college English. But I believe in education as far as liberation is concerned. And so that is definitely something that needs to happen. People, 
you need to be able to mention imperialism to somebody on the street and they'll be like, yeah, I know what that is. But then we also have to harness that power, harness voting power. You know, for those of us who vote, harness voting power. And for those of us who do other things, well, Yeah, I can project, I think. Uh, don't leave the microphone. Um, some years ago, there was a Palestinian Solidarity Conference at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. And as a part of that conference, um, some blacks and Palestinians decided to have a black-Palestinian dialogue. Now, there's a long history to the black-Palestinian dialogue, Kwame Ture, uh, was a part of that back in the 60s. And so at this particular moment in time, it seems important that we do our best work. Mm. And there's an opening. Uh, the UN has declared this whole decade, exactly. the decade of people of African descent. Mm. And since Durban, where that alliance seemed to come together again when the Palestinians were marching and protesting, and all of the Africans from around the world were demanding reparations, and certainly the Palestinians are due reparations. And so there's a lot of unity that we can have at this point. Mm -hmm. But it's a difficult fight, and it seems so important that we talk about what the problems are. Ahmad, is it Ahmad? <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate you bringing up <laughs> the Arab thing, uh, because we really do need to understand what the problems are and what the state of things are in Palestine politically, because all of us saw that slaughter last year. And I kept thinking, surely the whole world is, and people were marching everywhere. The whole world was outraged. And how do we build on that strategically? Because at Mother Emmanuel, when the worshipers were shot and killed, all of a sudden, the Confederate flag started coming down. Alabama, you know, everywhere because what has been done to African people is the Achilles heel of the United States. Because that's why you can get so much out of Black Lives Matter. And if you look at the history of this, the Black Liberation Movement has been the spark for so many things. And this is the time that we gotta put that all together for the Palestinian struggle. And we can do that. We can do that in this country. And so, and so I say that that we can figure out some way to keep having those conversations about building the black Palestinian dialogue so that we really talk about what the problems are. Some of you may have heard me mention Friday night that um, uh, there was this big dialogue with the Palestinians when a bunch of us got invited uh, through Seville, the Christian Palestinian network. And that debate between the Palestinians that we got to watch about the one state, two state strategy. I learned so much. And so these are the kinds of things of understanding the different mixes and what's going on so we understand what the complications are so that we can work with that because we have complications too. We have the Christian Zionists and we have some problems in terms of the black community that we need to kind of work on. But I just want to put out a call for us to really kind of build that up in every community where we are mm -hmm. to start rebuilding that black Palestinian dialogue, especially at this moment yes. when black lives matter, yeah. especially at this moment. Thank you. Um, we have two more questions and that's just about the amount of time you have. Okay, so we have five minutes. <laughs> so let's just start with you. Okay, uh, my name is Masai. And I started this as a question because I thought that was <laughs> I'll do it that way. <coughs> you see the need to really look into the organized struggle of African folk people for independence and how that's connected to the Palestinian struggle. And I'm saying that even though I know some of y'all do know, and specifically I'm talking about the New African Independence Movement, provisional government was founded in 1968. So even when you talk about relationships here with the Palestinian struggle, that, that those folks who have struggled for independence have always had that relationship. Uh, and again, I bring that up because like as folks are talking about going forward, uh, there's a lot of times the tendency to talk about the African American, but not that independence movement, including, and I know the National Lawyers Guild is involved with this, 
the struggle around the political prisoners and POWs who we have in U.S. prisons. Some of them have been here 30, 40 years and more. Uh, and again, like I said, I know some of y'all do because I know it's been brought up. I know we brought this up and spoke with this uh, Black Lives Matter. And again, we, I'm raising because we want to make sure it's on the table, but we do think as folks talk about going forward that you do know it because we know some folks are so young they don't even know where some of our folks are. They're dead and they're in prison, but the, the connection is there, including on the armed front. And I say that because I spent 14 years there as a member of the Black Liberation Army. Mm -hmm. So we relate to the fact that colonial uh, people on the oppression, oppression have the right to struggle by any means necessary, and we think that needs to be included in the dialogue. Excellent. So Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. I just, uh, my name is Jen. I just wanted to respond to close to the end, Nadia. You said, I forget the exact words, but you said something like, um, when what we do succeeds, if it succeeds. And you also reference how Adala doesn't win most of your court cases. And I, and I just wanted to respond to that by saying, and I think you all demonstrated this so clearly, that success is, is not measured just in whether you win the legal battle or whether you get justice from the from the you know structural state oppressive systems of justice, and I know mm -hmm. like my whole work has been about trying to trying to bring about alternative forms of justice through raising people's stories. And I know there's people in this room who who I stood with almost exactly four years ago now when Troy Davis was murdered by the state of Georgia, who I stood with you know on death row in Jackson, Georgia, and we did not save Troy's life in that struggle, but it mattered that we were there, it mattered to Troy as he was taken to the execution chamber, as he knew his family was surrounded by love that night, and it mattered and it still matters to his family. And I think that's that's about the, the deep relationship uh, and fueled by the love um, that you were all talking about. So I just I just wanted to make sure that you know some of the some of the ways that what we do matter can't be measured in, in victories that we can you know print out and put on the walls, but um, but it matters so very deeply. Thank you so much for the uh, uh, heads up, but uh, I am a registered voter, and I do vote. Um, but what I was specifically referring to was voting power, which is something a little bit different than just merely uh, registering and voting for the greater and more effective of two evils. Um, I think that uh, for those who choose to go that route, that, um, and, and by the way, there are Palestinian Americans who are able to vote. Um, there's a significant population here in the United States and, and their allies. Um, for me, I think it's important that, you know, while we're building voting power, that, you know, while people are campaigning, they're trying to convince us that they want this job. And so one of the ways they can get this job is, hi, what is your position on Palestine? Why is it we are sending so much money, schools are being closed, you know, uh, social programs are being cut, 
and yet Israel gets a new check to murder Palestinians like you know every few months or so. Why is it, Obama, that you know you will you know talk trash about Netanyahu one week and then send them a check the next week? You know why is it? Um, Nathan Deal, who is the governor, that you stand forward and that you say that you will stand with Israel. Why is it that, uh, and, and you know, guys, I'm just gonna put this out here because we're almost done and I can be as real as possible. <laughs> Why is it that Bernie Sanders, along with other 99 other senators, as well as John Lewis and Hank Johnson and everybody else voted to send $225 million to Israel to fortify their dome. You can look it up, you can see the voting record. While they were mastering Palestinians. And how dare they turn their back on Netanyahu like they didn't send that money. You know, I mean, that's like saying, oh no, I'm not with her, and then calling her later. It's like, why is it that there's no consistency? Like, that is some simple stuff to do, you know? Like, you don't even have to set anything on fire. All you have to, well, actually, just mentioning it is setting it on fire. Name names. You know, Obama, what's up? You know, Hillary, what's up? Bernie, come on, you cannot be silent about this anymore. You know, you cannot. Why should we continue to pick the lesser of two evils, which is really the more effective of two evils? Because we keep forgetting which country we live in. We live in a country that COINTELPRO happened. We live in a country where they passed NDAA, you know, and all sorts of other stuff. You know, we have, you know, peace activists and Palestinian activists who are being rounded up. You know, we had, you know, as my brother said, we have political prisoners. Why is it we're not directly addressing these people? Just because we have the first black president, just because we don't want the Republicans in office, does not mean we should be silent and allow the Democrats to continue these imperialist and capitalist policies.